Denis Diderot, French, Ni did O, the 5th of October 1713 to the 31st of July 1784, was a French philosopher, art critic, and writer, best known for serving as co-founder, chief editor, and contributor to the Encyclopédie along with Jean Le Rond d'Alembert. He was a prominent figure during the Enlightenment. Diderot began his education by obtaining a Master of Arts degree in philosophy at a Jesuit college in 1732. He considered working in the church clergy before briefly studying law. When he decided to become a writer in 1734, his father disowned him for not entering one of the learned professions. He lived a bohemian existence for the next decade. He befriended philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 1742. Though his work was broad as well as rigorous, it did not bring Diderot riches. He secured none of the posts that were occasionally given to needy men of letters, he could not even obtain the bare official recognition of merit that was implied by being chosen a member of the Académie Française. He saw no alternative to selling his library to provide a dowry for his daughter. Empress Catherine II of Russia heard of his financial troubles and commissioned an agent in Paris to buy the library. She then requested that the philosopher retain the books in Paris until she required them, and act as her librarian with a yearly salary. Between October 1773 and March 1774, the sick Diderot spent a few months at the Empress's court in St. Petersburg. Diderot died of pulmonary thrombosis in Paris on 31 July 1784, and was buried in the city's Aigle Saint Roch. His heirs sent his vast library to Catherine II, who had it deposited at the National Library of Russia. He has several times been denied burial in the Pantheon with other French notables. The French government considered memorializing him in this fashion on the 300th anniversary of his birth, but this did not come to pass. Diderot's literary reputation during his lifetime rested primarily on his plays and his contributions to the Encyclopédie. Many of his most important works, including Jacques the Fatalist, Rameau's Nephew, Paradox of the Actor, and D'Alembert's Dream, were published only after his death. Early life Denis Diderot was born in Langres, Champagne. His parents were Didier Diderot a cutler, maître coutelier, and his wife Angélique Vigneron Three of five siblings survived to adulthood, Denise Diderot and their youngest brother Pierre Didier Diderot and finally their sister Angelique Diderot According to Arthur McCandless Wilson, Denis Diderot greatly admired his sister Denise, sometimes referring to her as a female Socrates. Diderot began his formal education at a Jesuit college in Langres, earning a Master of Arts degree in philosophy in 1732. He then entered the College d'Arcourt of the University of Paris. He abandoned the idea of entering the clergy and decided to study at the Paris Law Faculty. His study of law was short-lived however and in 1734, he decided to become a writer. Because of his refusal to enter one of the learned professions, he was disowned by his father, and for the next ten years he lived a bohemian existence. In 1742, he befriended Jean Jacques Rousseau. In 1743, he further alienated his father by marrying Antoinette Champion, 1710 to 1796, a devout Roman Catholic. The match was considered inappropriate due to Champion's low social standing, poor education, fatherless status, and lack of a dowry. She was about three years older than Diderot. The marriage, in October 1743, produced one surviving child, a girl. Her name was Angelique, named after both Diderot's dead mother and sister. The death of his sister, a nun, in her convent may have affected Diderot's opinion of religion. She is assumed to have been the inspiration for his novel about a nun, La Religieuse, in which he depicts a woman who is forced to enter a convent where she suffers at the hands of the other nuns in the community. Diderot had affairs with Mlle Babouti, who would marry Gruz, Madeleine de Puisia, Sophie Volland, and Mie de Meaux. His letters to Sophie Volland are known for their candor and are regarded to be among the literary treasures of the 18th century. Early works 
Diderot's earliest works included a translation of Temple Stanyan's History of Greece 1743, with two colleagues, François Vincent Toussaint and Marc Antoine Idis. He produced a translation of Robert James's Medicinal Dictionary 1746 to 1748. In 1745, he published a translation of Shaftesbury's Inquiry Concerning Virtue and Merit, to which he had added his own reflections. Topic. Philosophical thoughts In 1746, Diderot wrote his first original work, The Philosophical Thoughts French, Pensées Philosophiques. In this book, Diderot argued for a reconciliation of reason with feeling so as to establish harmony. According to Diderot, without feeling there is a detrimental effect on virtue, and no possibility of creating sublime work. However, since feeling without discipline can be destructive, reason is necessary to control feeling. At the time Diderot wrote this book, he was a deist. Hence, there is a defense of deism in this book, and some arguments against atheism. The book also contains criticism of Christianity. Topic: The Skeptics Walk. In 1747, Diderot wrote The Skeptic's Walk French, Promenade du Sceptic in which a deist, an atheist, and a pantheist have a dialogue on the nature of divinity. The deist gives the argument from design. The atheist says that the universe is better explained by physics, chemistry, matter, and motion. The pantheist says that the cosmic unity of mind and matter, which are co-eternal and comprise the universe, is God. This work remained unpublished till 1830. The local police, warned by the priests of another attack on Christianity, either seized the manuscript, or authorities forced Diderot give an undertaking that he would not publish this work, according to different versions of what happened. Topic. The indiscreet jewels In 1748, Diderot needed to raise money on short notice. He had become a father through his wife, and his mistress Mie, de Puisia was making financial demands from him. At this time, Diderot had stated to me, de Puisia that writing a novel was a trivial task, whereupon she challenged him to write a novel. In response, Diderot wrote his novel The Indiscreet Jewels French, Les Bijoux Indiscrets. The book is about the magical ring of a sultan which induces any woman's discreet jewels to confess their sexual experiences when the ring is pointed at them. In all, the ring is pointed at 30 different women in the book, usually at a dinner or a social meeting, with the sultan typically being visible to the woman. However, since the ring has the additional property of making its owner invisible when required, a few of the sexual experiences recounted are through direct observation with the sultan making himself invisible and placing his person in the unsuspecting woman's boudoir. Besides the bodiness there are several digressions into philosophy, music, and literature in the book. In one such philosophical digression, the sultan has a dream in which he sees a child named experiment. Growing bigger and stronger till it demolishes an ancient temple named Hypothesis. The book proved to be lucrative for Diderot even though it could only be sold clandestinely. It is Diderot's most published work. The book is believed to be an imitation of La Safa. Topic. Scientific work Diderot would keep writing on science in a desultory way all his life. The scientific work of which he was most proud was Memoirs sur différents sujets de mathématiques 1748. This work contains original ideas on acoustics, tension, air resistance, and a project for a new organ, which could be played by all. Some of Diderot's scientific works were applauded by contemporary publications of his time like the Gentleman's Magazine, the Journal des Savants, and the Jesuit publication Journal de Trevoux, which invited more such work on the part of a man as clever and able as M. Diderot seems to be, of whom we should also observe that his style is as elegant, trenchant, and unaffected as it is lively and ingenious." Topic. Letter on the Blind Diderot's celebrated Letter on the Blind Lettre sur les avougles à la sige de ce qui voyant introduced him to the world as an original thinker. The subject is a discussion of the interrelation between man's reason and the knowledge acquired through perception the five senses. The title of his book also evoked some ironic doubt about who exactly were the blind under discussion. 
In the essay, blind English mathematician Nicholas Saunderson argues that, since knowledge derives from the senses, mathematics is the only form of knowledge that both he and a sighted person can agree on. It is suggested that the blind could be taught to read through their sense of touch. A later essay, Lettre sur les Sourds et Muets, considered the case of a similar deprivation in the deaf and mute. According to Jonathan Israel, what makes the Lettre sur les Avougles so remarkable, however, is its distinct, if undeveloped, presentation of the theory of variation and natural selection. This powerful essay, for which Lemaitre expressed warm appreciation in 1751, revolves around a remarkable deathbed scene in which a dying blind philosopher, Saunderson, rejects the arguments of a deist clergyman who endeavors to win him round to a belief in a providential God during his last hours. Saunderson's arguments are those of a neo-Spinozist naturalist and fatalist, using a sophisticated notion of the self-generation and natural evolution of species without creation or supernatural intervention. The notion of thinking matter is upheld in the argument from design, discarded following Lemaitre as hollow and unconvincing. The work appeared anonymously in Paris in June 1749, and was vigorously suppressed by the authorities. Diderot, who had been under police surveillance since 1747, was swiftly identified as the author, had his manuscripts confiscated, and was imprisoned for some months, under a lettre de cachet, on the outskirts of Paris, in the dungeons at Vincennes where he was visited almost daily by Rousseau, at the time his closest and most assiduous ally. Voltaire wrote an enthusiastic letter to Diderot commending the lettre and stating that he had held Diderot in high regard for a long time to which Diderot had sent a warm response. Soon after this, Diderot was arrested. Science historian Conway Zirkel has written that Diderot was an early evolutionary thinker and noted that his passage that described natural selection was so clear and accurate that it almost seems that we would be forced to accept his conclusions as a logical necessity even in the absence of the evidence collected since his time. Topic: <laughs> Incarceration and release. Angered by public resentment over the Peace of Aix-la-Chapelle, the government started incarcerating many of its critics. It was decided at this time to reign in Diderot. On 23 July 1749, the governor of the Vincennes fortress instructed the police to incarcerate Diderot, and the next day he was arrested and placed in solitary confinement in the Vincennes. He had been permitted to retain one book that he had in his possession at the time of his arrest, Paradise Lost, which he read during his incarceration. He wrote notes and annotations on the book, using a toothpick as a pen, and ink that he made by scraping slate from the walls and mixing it with wine. In August 1749, Mie du Chatelet, presumably at Voltaire's behest, wrote to the governor of Vincennes, who was her kinsman, pleading that Diderot be lodged more comfortably while jailed. The governor then offered Diderot access to the great halls of the Vincennes castle and the freedom to receive books and visitors providing he would write a document of submission. On 13 August 1749, Diderot wrote to the governor, I admit to you less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 that the Ponces, the Bijoux, and the Lettre sur les Avougles are debaucheries of the mind that escaped from me, but I can promise you on my honor and I do have honor that they will be the last, and that they are the only ones. As for those who have taken part in the publication of these works, nothing will be hidden from you. I shall depose verbally, in the depths secrecy of your heart, the names both of the publishers and the printers. On 20 August, Diderot was lodged in a comfortable room in the Vincennes, allowed to meet visitors, and to walk in the gardens of the Vincennes. On 23 August, Diderot signed another letter promising to never leave the Vincennes without permission. On 3 November 1749, Diderot was released from the Vincennes. Subsequently, in 1750, he released the prospectus for the Encyclopédie. Encyclopédie Genesis André Le Breton, a bookseller and printer, approached Diderot with a project for the publication of a translation of Ephraim Chambers' Cyclopedia, or Universal Dictionary of Arts and Sciences into French, first undertaken by the Englishman John Mills, and followed by the German Gottfried Celius. Diderot accepted the proposal, and transformed it. He persuaded Le Breton to publish a new work, which would consolidate ideas and knowledge from the Republic of Letters. The publishers found capital for a larger enterprise than they had first planned. 
Jean La Ronde d'Alembert was persuaded to become Diderot's colleague, and permission was procured from the government. In 1750 an elaborate prospectus announced the project, and in 1751 the first volume was published. This work was unorthodox and advanced for the time. Diderot stated that, "...an encyclopedia ought to make good the failure to execute such a project hitherto, and should encompass not only the fields already covered by the academies, but each and every branch of human knowledge." Comprehensive knowledge will give, "...the power to change men's common way of thinking." The work combines scholarship with information on trades. Diderot emphasized the abundance of knowledge within each subject area. Everyone would benefit from these insights. Topic. Controversies Diderot's work, however, was mired in controversy from the beginning. The project was suspended by the courts in 1752. Just as the second volume was completed accusations arose regarding seditious content, concerning the editor's entries on religion and natural law. Diderot was detained and his house was searched for manuscripts for subsequent articles, but the search proved fruitless as no manuscripts could be found. They were hidden in the house of an unlikely confederate, Shritin de Lamoignon Malesherbes, who originally ordered the search. Although Malesherbes was a staunch absolutist, and loyal to the monarchy, he was sympathetic to the literary project. Along with his support, and that of other well-placed influential confederates, the project resumed. Diderot returned to his efforts only to be constantly embroiled in controversy. These twenty years were to Diderot not merely a time of incessant drudgery, but harassing persecution and desertion of friends. The ecclesiastical party detested the Encyclopédie, in which they saw a rising stronghold for their philosophic enemies. By 1757 they could endure it no longer, the subscribers had grown from 2,000 to 4,000, a measure of the growth of the work in popular influence and power. Diderot wanted the Encyclopédie to give all the knowledge of the world to the people of France. However, the Encyclopédie threatened the governing social classes of France aristocracy because it took for granted the justice of religious tolerance, freedom of thought, and the value of science and industry. It asserted the doctrine that the main concern of the nation's government ought to be the nation's common people. It was believed that the Encyclopédie was the work of an organized band of conspirators against society, and that the dangerous ideas they held were made truly formidable by their open publication. In 1759, the Encyclopédie was formally suppressed. The decree did not stop the work, which went on, but its difficulties increased by the necessity of being clandestine. Jean La Ronde d'Alembert withdrew from the enterprise and other powerful colleagues, including Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot, Baron de Laun, declined to contribute further to a book which had acquired a bad reputation. Topic. Diderot's contribution Diderot was left to finish the task as best he could. He wrote several hundred articles, some very slight, but many of them laborious, comprehensive, and long. He damaged his eyesight correcting proofs and editing the manuscripts of less competent contributors. He spent his days at workshops, mastering manufacturing processes, and his nights writing what he had learned during the day. He was incessantly harassed by threats of police raids. The last copies of the first volume were issued in 1765. In 1764, when his immense work was drawing to an end, he encountered a crowning mortification. He discovered that the bookseller, Le Breton, fearing the government's displeasure, had struck out from the proof sheets, after they had left Diderot's hands, all passages that he considered too dangerous. He and his printing house overseer, writes for Bank, had worked in complete secrecy, and had moreover deliberately destroyed the author's original manuscript so that the damage could not be repaired. The monument to which Diderot had given the labor of twenty long and oppressive years was irreparably mutilated and defaced. It was twelve years, in 1772, before the subscribers received the final 28 folio volumes of the Encyclopédie, au Dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des métiers since the first volume had been published. Topic. Mature works Although the Encyclopédie was Diderot's most monumental product, he was the author of many other works that sowed nearly every intellectual field with new and creative ideas. 
Diderot's writing ranges from a graceful trifle like the regrets sur ma vieille robe de chambre regrets for my old dressing gown up to the heady d'Alembert's dream Le rêve de d'Alembert composed 1769, a philosophical dialogue in which he plunges into the depths of the controversy as to the ultimate constitution of matter and the meaning of life. Jacques Le Fataliste written in 1773, but not published until 1792 in German and 1796 in French is similar to Tristram Shandy and the sentimental journey in its challenge to the conventional novel's structure and content. <laughs> Rameau's nephew The dialogue Rameau's nephew French, Le Niveau de Rameau is a farce tragedy. Reminiscent of the satires of Horace, a favorite classical author of Diderot's whose lines, Vertumnis, quote quo sunt, natus iniquis, a man born when every single vertumnus was out of sorts, appear as epigraph. According to Nicholas Cronk, Rameau's nephew is, arguably the greatest work of the French Enlightenment's greatest writer. Diderot's intention in writing the dialogue, whether as a satire on contemporary manners, a reduction of the theory of self-interest to an absurdity, the application of irony to the ethics of ordinary convention, a mere setting for a discussion about music, or a vigorous dramatic sketch of a parasite and a human original—is disputed. In political terms it explores the bipolarization of the social classes under absolute monarchy. And insofar as its protagonist demonstrates how the servant often manipulates the master, Le Niveau de Rameau can be seen to anticipate Hegel's master slave dialectic. The narrator in the book recounts a conversation with Jean Francois Rameau, nephew of the famous Jean Philippe Rameau. The nephew composes and teaches music with some success but feels disadvantaged by his name and is jealous of his uncle. Eventually, he sinks into an indolent and debauched state. After his wife's death, he loses all self-esteem and his brusque manners result in him being ostracized by former friends. A character profile of the nephew is now sketched by Diderot, a man who was once wealthy and comfortable with a pretty wife, who is now living in poverty and decadence, shunned by his friends. And yet this man retains enough of his past to analyze his despondency philosophically and maintains his sense of humor. Essentially he believes in nothing. Not in religion, nor in morality, nor in the Russian view about nature being better than civilization since in his opinion every species in nature consumes one another. He views the same process at work in the economic world where men consume each other through the legal system. The wise man, according to the nephew, will consequently practice hedonism. Hurrah for wisdom and philosophy, the wisdom of Solomon, to drink good wines, gorge on choice foods, tumble pretty women, sleep on downy beds, outside of that, all is vanity. The dialogue ends with Diderot calling the nephew a wastrel, a coward, and a glutton devoid of spiritual values to which the nephew replies, I believe you are right. The publication history of the nephew is circuitous. Written in 1761, Diderot never saw the work through to publication during his lifetime, and apparently did not even share it with his friends. After Diderot's death, a copy of the text reached Schiller, who gave it to Goethe, who, in 1805, translated the work into German. Goethe's translation entered France, and was retranslated into French in 1821. Another copy of the text was published in 1823, but it had been expurgated by Diderot's daughter prior to publication. The original manuscript was only found in 1891. <inaudible> <inaudible> visual arts Diderot's most intimate friend was the philologist Friedrich Melchior Grimm. They were brought together by their friend in common at that time, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In 1753, Grimm began writing a newsletter, the La Correspondence Littéraire. Philosophique et Critique, which he would send to various high personages in Europe. In 1759, Grimm asked Diderot to report on the biennial art exhibitions in the Louvre for the correspondence. Diderot reported on the salons between 1759 and 1771 and again in 1775 and 1781. Diderot's reports would become the most celebrated contributions to La Correspondence. According to Charles Augustin Saint Beuve, Diderot's reports initiated the French into a new way of laughing, and introduced people to the mystery and purport of color by ideas. Before Diderot, Anne Louise Germain de Stael wrote, 
I had never seen anything in pictures except dull and lifeless colors, it was his imagination that gave them relief and life, and it is almost a new sense for which I am indebted to his genius." Diderot had appended an essay sur la peinture to his report on the 1765 Salon in which he expressed his views on artistic beauty. Goethe described the essay sur la peinture as a magnificent work, it speaks even more usefully to the poet than to the painter, though for the painter too it is a torch of blazing illumination." Jean-Baptiste Greuze was Diderot's favorite contemporary artist. Diderot appreciated Greuze's sentimentality, and more particularly Greuze's portrayals of his wife who had once been Diderot's mistress. Theater. Diderot wrote sentimental plays, La Fils Naturelle and La Peur de Famille accompanying them with essays on theatrical theory and practice, including Les Intrations sur la Fils Naturelle, Conversations on the Natural Sun, in which he announced the principles of a new drama, the serious genre, a realistic midpoint between comedy and tragedy that stood in opposition to the stilted conventions of the classical French stage. Diderot introduced the concept of the fourth wall, the imaginary wall, at the front of the stage in a traditional three-walled box set in a proscenium theater, through which the audience sees the action in the world of the play. <laughs> Diderot and Catherine the Great <laughs> <laughs> Journey to Russia When the Russian Empress Catherine the Great heard that Diderot was in need of money, she arranged to buy his library and appoint him caretaker of it until his death, at a salary of 1,000 livres per year. She even paid him 25 years' salary in advance. Although Diderot hated traveling, he was obliged to visit her. On 9 October 1773, he reached St. Petersburg, met Catherine the next day, and they had several discussions on various subjects. During his five month stay at her court, he met her almost every day. During these conversations, he would later state, they spoke man to man, he would occasionally make his point by slapping her thighs. In a letter to Madame Geoffrin, Catherine wrote, Your Diderot is an extraordinary man. I emerge from interviews with him with my thighs bruised and quite black. I have been obliged to put a table between us to protect myself and my members. One of the topics discussed was Diderot's ideas about how to transform Russia into a utopia. In a letter to Comte de Sager, the Empress wrote that if she followed Diderot's advice, chaos would ensue in her kingdom. Back in France When returning, Diderot asked the Empress for 1,500 roubles as reimbursement for his trip. She gave him 3,000 roubles, an expensive ring, and an officer to escort him back to Paris. He would write a eulogy in her honor on reaching Paris. In July 1784, upon hearing that Diderot was in poor health, Catherine arranged for him to move into a luxurious suite in the Rue de Richelieu. Diderot died two weeks after moving there. On 31 July 1784, among Diderot's last works were notes, "...on the instructions of Her Imperial Majesty for the drawing up of laws." This commentary on Russia included replies to some arguments Catherine had made in the Nakas. Diderot wrote that Catherine was certainly despotic, due to circumstances and training, but was not inherently tyrannical. Thus, if she wished to destroy despotism in Russia, she should abdicate her throne and destroy anyone who tries to revive the monarchy. She should publicly declare that, There is no true sovereign other than the nation, and there can be no true legislator other than the people. She should create a new Russian legal code establishing an independent legal framework and starting with the text. We the people, and we the sovereign of this people, swear conjointly these laws, by which we are judged equally." In the Nakas, Catherine had written, "...it is for legislation to follow the spirit of the nation." Diderot's rebuttal stated that it is for legislation to make the spirit of the nation. For instance, he argued, it is not appropriate to make public executions unnecessarily horrific. Ultimately, Diderot decided not to send these notes to Catherine, however, they were delivered to her with his other papers after he died. When she read them, she was furious and commented that they were an incoherent gibberish devoid of prudence, insight, and verisimilitude. Philosophy 
In his youth, Diderot was originally a follower of Voltaire and his deist Anglomanie, but gradually moved away from this line of thought towards materialism and atheism, a move which was finally realized in 1747 in the philosophical debate in the second part of his The Skeptic's Walk 1747. Diderot opposed mysticism and occultism, which were highly prevalent in France at the time he wrote, and believed religious truth claims must fall under the domain of reason, not mystical experience or esoteric secrets. However, Diderot showed some interest in the work of Paracelsus. He was, "...a philosopher in whom all the contradictions of the time struggle with one another." Rosencrantz in his 1754 book On the Interpretation of Nature, Diderot expounded on his views about nature, evolution, materialism, mathematics, and experimental science. It is speculated that Diderot may have contributed to his friend Baron Dolbach's 1770 book The System of Nature. Diderot had enthusiastically endorsed the book stating that, what I like is a philosophy clear, definite, and frank, such as you have in the system of nature. The author is not an atheist on one page and a deist on another. His philosophy is all of one piece. In conceiving the Encyclopédie, Diderot had thought of the work as a fight on behalf of posterity and had expressed confidence that posterity would be grateful for his effort. According to Diderot, "...posterity is for the philosopher what the other world is for the man of religion." Topic. Appreciation and influence Marmontel and Henri Meister commented on the great pleasure of having intellectual conversations with Diderot. Morellet, a regular attendee at Dolbach Salon, wrote, It is there that I heard Diderot treat questions of philosophy, art, or literature, and by his wealth of expression, fluency, and inspired appearance, hold our attention for a long stretch of time. Diderot's contemporary, and rival, Jean-Jacques Rousseau wrote in his Confessions that after a few centuries Diderot would be accorded as much respect by posterity as was given to Plato and Aristotle. In Germany, Goethe, Schiller, and Lessing expressed admiration for Diderot's writings, Goethe pronouncing Diderot's Rameau's nephew to be the classical work of an outstanding man, and that Diderot is Diderot, a unique individual, whoever carps at him and his affairs is a Philistine. In the next century, Diderot was admired by Balzac, Delacroix, Stendhal, Zola, and Schopenhauer. According to Comte, Diderot was the foremost intellectual in an exciting age. Historian Michelet described him as the true Prometheus and stated that Diderot's ideas would continue to remain influential long into the future. Marx chose Diderot as his favorite prose writer. Topic: <laughs> Contemporary tributes. Otis Fellows and Norman Torrey have described Diderot as the most interesting and provocative figure of the French 18th century. In 1993, American writer Kathleen Shine published Rameau's Nice, a satire of academic life in New York that took as its premise a woman's research into an imagined 18th century pornographic parody of Diderot's Rameau's nephew. The book was praised by Machiko Kakutani in the New York Times as a nimble philosophical satire of the academic mind, and an enchanting comedy of modern manners. French author Eric Emmanuel Schmidt wrote a play titled Le Libertin, the Libertine, which imagines a day in Diderot's life, including a fictional sitting for a woman painter, which becomes sexually charged but is interrupted by the demands of editing the Encyclopédie. It was first staged at Paris's Théâtre Montparnasse in 1997 starring Bernard Guirado as Diderot and Christiane Cohendy as Madame Therbouche and was well received by critics. In 2013, the tricentennial of Diderot's birth, his hometown of Langres held a series of events in his honour and produced an audio tour of the town highlighting places that were part of Diderot's past, including the remains of the convent where his sister Angelique took her vows. On 6 October 2013, a Museum of the Enlightenment focusing on Diderot's contributions to the movement, the Maison des Lumières Denis Diderot, was inaugurated in Langres. Bibliography Essay sur le mérite et la vertu, written by Shaftesbury French translation and annotation by Diderot Philosophical Thoughts, Essay, 1746. La Promenade du Septic, 1747. 
The Indiscreet Jewels, Novel, 1748. Lettre sur les avougles à la sige de ce qui voyant, Encyclopédie, 1750-1765. Lettre sur les sourds et muettes, Pensées sur l'interprétation de la nature, essay, 1751. Système de la nature, 1754. Le fils naturel, 1757. Intrusions sur le fils naturel, 1757. Le père de famille, 1758. Discours sur la poésie dramatique, 1758. Salons, Critique d'art, 1759 to 1781. La religieuse, Roman, 1760, revised in 1770 and in the early 1780s. The novel was first published as a volume posthumously in 1796. Le niveau de Rameau, Dialogue, 1763. Lettre sur le commerce de la librairie, 1763. Mystification au la histoire des portraits, 1768. Intrition entre d'Alembert et Diderot, 1769. Le Rêve de D'Alembert, Dialogue, 1769. Suite de l'entretien entre D'Alembert et Diderot, 1769. Paradox sur le Comédien, written between 1770 and 1778, first published posthumously in 1830. Apologie de l'Abbé Galliani, 1770. Principes philosophiques sur la matière et le mouvement, essay, 1770. Entretien d'une pur avec ses enfants, 1771. Jacques le Fataliste et son maître, novel, 1771 to 1778. Ceci n'est pas un conte, story, 1772. Madame de la Carlier, short story and moral fable, 1772. Supplement au voyage de Bougainville, 1772. Histoire philosophique et politique des deux Indies, in collaboration with Reynal, 1772 to 1781. Voyage en Hollande, 1773. Elements de physiologie, 1773 to 1774. Refutation de Helvetius, 1774. Observations sur la Nacas, 1774. Essay sur les regnes de Claude et de Nairon, 1778. Est il bon? Est il méchant? 1781. Lettre apologétique de l'abbé Reynal à Monsieur Grimm. 1781. Ox insurgents de Miri. 1782. Topic. See also. Topic. Notes. Topic. References. Topic. Further reading Anderson, Wilda C. Diderot's Dream. Baltimore, Johns Hopkins University Press, 1990. App, Ors, 2010. The Birth of Orientalism. Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania Press, ISBN 978-0-8122-4261-4, pp. 133-87 on Diderot's role in the European discovery of Hinduism and Buddhism. Azurmendi, Jocks Entretien d'une philosophie, Diderot 1713-1784, Jakin, 32-111-121. Ballstadt, Kurt P. A. Diderot, Natural Philosopher. Oxford, Voltaire Foundation, 2008. Blom, Philip. 2010. The Wicked Company. New York, Basic Books. Bloom, Carol. 1974. Diderot, The Virtue of a Philosopher. Brewer, Daniel. Using the Encyclopedia, Ways of Knowing, Ways of Reading. Oxford, Voltaire Foundation, 2002. Clark, Andrew Herrick. Diderot's Part. Aldershot, Hampshire, England, Ashgate, 2008. Kaplan, J. Framed Narratives, Diderot's Genealogy of the Beholder. Manchester, Manchester Up, 1986. Crocker, Lester G. 1974. Diderot's Chaotic Order, Approach to a Synthesis Curran, Andrew S. 2019. Diderot and the Art of Thinking Freely De La Carrera, Rosalina. Success in Circuit Lies, Diderot's Communicational Practice. 
Stanford, Calif. Stanford Up, 1991. Fellows, Otis E. 1989. Diderot. France, Peter. 1983. Diderot. Fontenay, Elizabeth de, and Jacques Proust. Interpretar Diderot aujourd'hui. Paris, Le Sycamore, 1984. Furbank, P. N. 1992. Diderot, A Critical Biography. New York, A. A. Knopf. ISBN 0 679 41421 5. Gregory Efrosini, Mary. 2006. Diderot and the Metamorphosis of Species Studies in Philosophy. New York, Routledge. ISBN 0 415 95551 3. Havens, George R. 1955. The Age of Ideas. New York, Holt. ISBN 0 89197 651 5. Hayes, Julia Candler. The Representation of the Self in the Theater of La Chasse, Diderot, and Sade. Ann Arbor, Michigan, University Microfilms International, 1982. Kavanaugh, Thomas. The Vacant Mirror, A Study of Mimesis Through Diderot's Jacques Le Fatalist, in Studies on Voltaire and the 18th Century 104, 1973. Coral Yove, Sergei V. La Bibliothèque de Diderot, Vers une reconstitution. Fernie Voltaire, Centre International d'études du ex v siècle, 2014. ISBN 978 2 84559 9 Jason. 2008. Diderot, Dennis. In Hamowy, Ronald. The Encyclopedia of Libertarianism. Thousand Oaks, CA, Sage, Cato Institute. pp. 124-25. Doi 101 N78. ISBN 978-1-4129-6580-4. LCCN 2008951. OCLC 750831024. Mason, John H. 1982. The Irresistible Diderot Peretz, Isle. 2013. Dramatic Experiments, Life According to Diderot State University of New York Press Rex, Walter E. Diderot's Counterpoints, The Dynamics of Contrariety in His Major Works. Oxford, Voltaire Foundation, 1998. Saint Amand, Pierre. Diderot. Saratoga, Calif. ANMA Libri, 1984. Simon, Julia. 1995. Mass Enlightenment. Albany, State University of New York Press. ISBN 0-7914-2638-6. Tunstall, Kate E. 2011. Blindness and Enlightenment. An Essay. With a new translation of Diderot's Letter on the Blind. Continuum Wilson, Arthur McCandless 1972. Diderot, The Standard Biography Vasco, Gerhard M. 1978. Diderot and Goethe, A Study in Science and Humanism, Library Slatkin, Library Champion. Topic primary sources Diderot, Dennis, ed. A Diderot Pictorial Encyclopedia of Trades and Industry, Volume 1 1993 reprint excerpt and text search Diderot, Dennis. Diderot, Political Writings ed., by John Hope Mason and Robert Walkler 1992 excerpt and text search, with introduction Diderot, Dennis. Thoughts on Religion 2002 edition, translated and edited by Nicholas Walter. G. W. Foote & Co. Limited Freethinkers Classics No. 4. ISBN 978-1-911578-02-4. Main works of Diderot in English translation Hoyt, Nelly & Cassere, Thomas. Encyclopedia, Selections, Diderot, D'Alembert, and a Society of Men of Letters. New York, Bob's Merrill Company, 1965. LCCN 65-26535. ISBN 0-672-60479-5. Topic external links Works by Denis Diderot at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Denis Diderot at Internet Archive Works by Denis Diderot at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Diderot Search Engine in French for Human Sciences in Tribute to Diderot Denis Diderot, Rev D'Alembert D'Alembert's Dream French and English Texts Conversation between D'Alembert and Diderot Alternate Translation of the First Part of the Above Denis Diderot Archive in English Denis Diderot Website in French in French Online Version of the Encyclopedia Encyclopedia. The articles are classified in alphabetical order 26 files.
The ARTFL Encyclopédie, provided by the ARTFL Project of the University of Chicago articles in French, scans of 18th-century print copies provided. The Encyclopedia of Diderot and D'Alembert Collaborative Translation Project, product of the Scholarly Publishing Office of the University of Michigan Library an effort to translate the Encyclopédie into English short biography Denis Diderot Bibliographie La Nouveau de Rameau, Diderot et Goethe The Encyclopédie, BBC Radio 4 Discussion with Judith Hawley, Caroline Warman and David Wooten in Our Time, October. 26, 2006.